Recently, I asked my girlfriend Kelly to marry me. Being the incredibly modest, attractive, lovable person I am, she of course said yes. The night we got engaged, we partied hard with our friends to celebrate. But through the next week we thought about it and decided we wanted a more private celebration for just the two of us. So we chose to go away for the weekend. As a couple we like to do things pretty budget. Accordingly we jumped on Airbnb to find a cheap B&B or something along those lines with two prerequisites. 1. Affordable 2. Out of a city or town. I wish we had of ignored point 2. I chose an area that in true Nosleep spirit I shall not name as I prefer to give people myself included their choice of privacy. But for setting it's a rural area on the east coast of Queensland, Australia inland from the beach, so we could spend the day beachside and then take a short drive to our accommodation. I didn't find much, and during the week I jumped on Airbnb a few times more to see what was around for what we wanted in our price range, and found nothing much of interest. The morning we were set to go away and celebrate, we realized we should probably decide on what we would do and where we would stay. We were still in bed, and I loaded up my laptop to check online for B&Bs again. Kelly told me I should be looking on Airbnb. I of course explained that there was nothing available, but she wouldn't believe me, so I loaded it up again. And of course, there it was. $70 a night for this cute little cottage in the bush of the Sunshine Coast hinterland. We booked it, got our stuff together, and hit the road. Kelly and I were having a great day. We hit the beach, got some fish and chips, and in the afternoon headed off to find where we were staying. The place we booked was a 20-minute drive through the hinterland from the small beach town we were in. As we turned off the motorway to head towards the cabin, a badly beat-up white 70s Holden Ute turned off the motorway after me and immediately hit the gas. He was right behind me, and I mean right behind me. If I had have braked or slowed even in the slightest, we would have touched bumpers. He sat there for a few seconds, then violently jerked out to the other lane and began to speed up, passing us on my side. As the ute cruised past, I looked to see what sort of jack arse this guy was. I'm glad he didn't hear what I thought of him. In the ute was John Jarrett from Wolf Creek. Not really, of course, but he had that same look about him, but no sideburns. Stop, I know, I'm using the biggest Aussie horror character in a Nosleep, believable ha. Huh? Readers from across the pond please understand a lot of men from the country from a certain generation have a similar style to John Gerrard's in Wolf Creek. Blue singlet, tattered jeans or shorts, flannelette shirt, and an Akubra hat or trucker's cap, or at least some combination of. From the moment his face came into sight to the moment, it disappeared from view, he stared straight at me, with this burning look of anger and annoyance sprayed across his face. What's his problem? Kelly asked as the ute sped over the crest ahead and disappeared. I didn't know, obviously, and told her he was probably just some angry dude who wanted to be home for a VB already. Not so long after this happened we found our accommodation barely. We were driving down the road, watching the map and the letterboxes, but unable to find it for ages. After two laps of the road, we spotted a mostly hidden and grown over gravel driveway with the right road number on a stump out by the road. Bingo, we were finally there. My 4x4 rumbled up the driveway, which wasn't as long as I expected it to be as you couldn't see anything but trees and scrub from the road, maybe 100 meters. The drive snaked around and slowly a fairly large concrete rendered house came into view. Then off to the side of the house just to our left behind some scrub was a small shipping container-sized cottage. It was about 60 or so meters from the house. It was perfect. Trees blocked the view from the house and cottage of each other. There was space for our 4x4, and the cottage itself was rad. Comfy F bed with perfect pillows and sheets, an end suite bathroom and a kitchenette. It was exactly what we needed. We dropped our stuff off and headed towards the house to say hi to the host. But she was almost at the cottage by the time we rounded the trees between the buildings. We introduced ourselves and made small talk about how beautiful her property was and about our good news, which she was so stoked about. We told her how we'd almost not even seen the Airbnb listing, 
and were lucky to be there, Sha told us that she would be heading out for the evening, but to call her if we needed anything. I told her jokingly that we'd keep an eye out for her. At the time I thought I noticed a split second of discomfort in her face as I said that, but didn't think anything more of it. The rest of the afternoon was spent drinking beers and smoking on the small patio in front of the cottage, talking shit and having fun. The property was a smoke-free zone, so until our host left later that afternoon we had to keep walking down the drive to have a smoke. Needless to say, we were waiting with bated breath for her to leave so we could smoke on the patio. She left around dusk. We almost missed it as we hadn't noticed the driveway we used when we arrived went no further than the cottage, and the house had a separate entrance on another road. Of course she owns a Prius, Kelly joked as the black Toyota drove out of the property from a half-walled carport. Later, once it got too cold, we decided to head inside and watch a movie in bed on the laptop. We chose the only movie available as there was no Wi-Fi the imitation game. About halfway through we decided it was about time for another cigarette and stepped out onto the patio. We were both pretty tired so didn't say a whole lot to each other and just enjoyed the silence. The silence. I began to notice just how silent it was. I'm from the bush originally so I know that there aren't the sounds you get in cities and towns, but this was different. The air was empty. I couldn't hear birds or insects or really anything. What I did hear though, I heard very clearly. There was one loud gunshot accompanied by a blood-curdling scream from a woman, and then silence again. Neither of us said anything to each other for what seemed like minutes. We just stood there in silence trying to get what just happened to register. I know you're thinking, City Boy doesn't know the difference between a car backfire and a gunshot. Well, I'm a country boy originally, and I know the sound of a gunshot in the bush. It's more like an explosive crack that bounds through the bush bouncing off everything it meets. After what must have in reality only been 30 seconds, I looked to Kelly and said, So, what do we want to do about that? She raised her finger to her mouth to silence me and kept looking into the dark with an expression of pure concern. I listened into the nothingness and began to hear systematic crunching in the bush towards the direction of the gunshot. Like someone was slowly walking though the bush, cracking sticks and gum nuts under their shoes. Go inside, turn the lights off, call the police and cuddle till it's over. She asked a minute or so later in reply to my earlier question. I agreed with her choice of action. I called emergency and discussed what had just happened to the police operator, who sounded concerned enough and promised us to have someone check it out as soon as they could. After the call, we returned to the bed and followed the rest of our brave plan. For the next ten minutes we laid there, squished together mostly in silence, so we could listen out for anything untoward outside the cabin. When we did talk, we discussed the options of what was probably really happening out there. We decided that it was most likely some stupid kids or adults really letting off a hunting rifle, and some girl or woman, or let's be honest, could have been a guy was stupidly screaming at the sound. We had managed to mostly calm ourselves down after those ten minutes, until our peace was interrupted again. Outside the side window of the cottage our bed was pressed against was a sensor light. You got it, one minute it was dead dark, the next minute light was blasting through the blinds. We both gripped each other hard at the shock and sat like stones in the bed. I can't vouch Kelly anymore, but mostly in my head I was trying to convince myself that it was just a possum or a wild cat. I almost had myself believing that, until the next sensor light went on. This one was located at the front of the cabin where the patio and door were, on the adjacent side to the first light. Kelly had closed all the curtains, so I couldn't really look outside from the bed to see anything and it was a difficult angle as the front door was at the same level almost as our heads, but I kept feeling like I could see a shadow moving around, though there was really nothing there. Less than a minute later, the far side sensor light flicked on, and then almost immediately the fourth light went on that shone on to the makeshift car space. We didn't do anything. We didn't feel we could do anything. There hadn't been any sounds during this, only the lights, so it still could have been anything. The car was of course also in the car space, so if it was something or someone, we couldn't escape as weren't going anywhere near where the sensor lights had been activated. 
After what seemed like forever, the light's timers turned themselves off one by one. After that, we were granted reprieve from the events of the evening. We started talking again about how it was just kids playing with a hunting rifle and a scared cat running around the building looking to hide. Or something. We don't really have much gun violence in Australia since our gun laws changed 20 years ago, so it was much more likely that we were wrong about the nefariousness of the gunshot. The only thing that didn't really work for me in this explanation was the scream. It didn't sound like a scream of shock or excitement. It sounded like fear, terror, loss, and all of the awful reasons people scream like that. Despite all of the events of the night, we finally managed to calm down and start to drift off. I wouldn't say I slept until almost daybreak, but I was pretty out of it for the rest of the night. The next morning we got our things together and headed out early. We had things planned and sure as shit wanted to get the F out of there. Before we left we each had a quick look around the cottage in the light to see if anything seemed off. Everything was pretty normal until I looked at the window next to our bed from the outside the cottage. What looked like a greasy face print like the nose and forehead stared back at me from the outside window. Kelly didn't see it, and I didn't even know if that's what I was so I let it be and noped the hell out of there. As we pulled out of the car space, I thought that maybe we should go say goodbye to our host, but I couldn't see our host's black Prius in her carport. I thought I could make out a white vehicle on the other side of the carport that I assumed was her second vehicle. I turned to Kelly, I think Nelly got a little lucky last night. She didn't find it that funny. We went to an aquarium at one of the bigger towns on the way back to the city we lived in, had some lunch and got back on the highway to go home. We were maybe an hour down the highway about halfway home when I saw in my rear view a white ute screaming up the outside lane in my direction. As it got closer, I started to think more and more that it was the same jack arse in the Holden ute from the day before. I know I should have been watching the road, but I couldn't not look as he drove past me. Sideburn less John Jarrett didn't make eye contact straight away this time, but as he came level with me, it seemed like he felt my gaze and turned his head towards me. He slowed his speed and coasted next to me for a few seconds, long enough to stare me straight in the eye, raise a finger to his mouth and wink at us. Once it seemed like he felt he'd made us uncomfortable enough. He sped up and slowly kept making his way past us to wherever he was going. This time as he drove past, I saw something I hadn't seen the day before when he overtook us. From my high position in the 4x4, I saw in the tray of his ute a long calico-looking bag or drop sheet wrapped around something about five or six feet long. It bounced around slightly as he hit cracks and bumps in the road. The last bump I noticed before I crashed our car into the tree-lined median strip between the lanes was our host Nellie's lifeless face coming free from the bag as the ute hit a particularly large pothole. Eight years ago, I rented a studio in Montpellier, France for one month. I prepaid and arrived at the studio at the arranged time. I was told to return the next day. Remember that I had already paid. I stayed one day before the owner asked me to leave. Why? Who knows? I am an African-American college professor who is planning to write for a month. Last year I rented another studio in Marseille for a month via Airbnb. The owner met me and let me in with no problem. There was an internet issue that was resolved by me purchasing my own service. Suddenly the owner wanted to come by with her boyfriend. She seemed to be uncomfortable. The boyfriend kept talking to me about Africa. I am African American. They asked me to leave although I paid for one month and had been there six days. I was frustrated as I was at the end of the semester and super busy. I left because I don't want to stay where I was not wanted. Airbnb kept more than 50% of my money even though I stayed for one week and paid for four. I will never use Airbnb again and the company clearly condones racism. I wanted all of my money refunded as I had to go to a hotel. I still want my money. Never again will I use Airbnb. I tell my friends and everyone I know not to use them. As a US citizen, there is no way in hell that I would rent an Airbnb in the US never.
What can I say? Something that should have been a lovely experience turned into a rather unpleasant one. We had seen an Airbnb listing and loved the photos of the fantastic views which persuaded us to book this cottage. Upon arrival, there was the owner's car parked on a small driveway, so we were unable to park two cars on it and had to leave one of them outside in a narrow lane. The cottage was unlocked, so we were able to walk inside. We then entered and decided to have a look around. The first thing we spotted was the unclean cooker. The door was covered in fat stains. When we opened the door and looked inside the cooker, this was even worse. It was caked in grime. The baking trays were also filthy. We cannot imagine the last time that this had been cleaned, and we proceeded to clean it ourselves so that it would be okay to cook in. There were cobwebs everywhere, on the walls, furniture, and plants. A mountain of rubbish behind the sofa. Stained sheets on both beds which looked like nobody had bothered to change from the previous customers. A stack of bricks on one corner of one of the beds to replace a broken leg. A tea towel hanging on the cooker door which was black with dirt. The owner's clothes left in the wardrobes and drawers with nowhere to hang our own clothes. Dirty dishes in the sink that had been left there. A filthy toaster. A filthy microwave. Outside in the outhouse, there was the washing machine and fridge freezer, plastered in dirt. We then called customer service at Airbnb to report the property. The girl on the end of the phone said we could stay in a hotel for the night if we wanted to leave and then find us another property the next day, and that we would be contacted within two hours with an update. Two hours passed without a call time now 10.30 p.m., so we messaged customer service to be told that another member of the team would be in contact soon. We heard nothing, so we had to stay at the property overnight. My partner didn't sleep at all, and at 5.15 a.m., I once again contacted customer services when we eventually were told we could have a full refund. That night we booked a hotel which we had to pay for out of our own money as it would take a few more days for the refund to appear in our account. This whole episode has been a nightmare from beginning to end. Properties in this condition should not be allowed to feature on the Airbnb listings. The host's excuse that there must have been a mix-up with her cleaner just doesn't cut it for us. This property had not been cleaned in months, and we have the photos to prove it. It has left us feeling disgusted and very angry, as this should have been a great experience spending time away, only for it to be ruined with state of the property and lack of contact from Airbnb. We will definitely think twice before booking again. Some travel bans are temporarily lifted, so I thought it would be the right time to take a chance and travel abroad. Normally, I am a bit wary about using Airbnb, but since the date I was looking for was precisely during Easter, prices were pretty high as well as limited availability, so I thought why not give this a shot. Although at the time, there really weren't many options for these days. I saw one that looked reasonable and I took it. What I immediately noticed that this person was already fully booked for three months and he had recently registered. I didn't get a direct message right away, which was already a bad sign. Usually hosts send a welcoming message or a thanks. As the days passed, I noticed that the host rarely said anything. He was evasive, concise, and slow. Then after a week, I started to worry. If this guy was fully booked, then why does he only have a few reviews? The given address was also difficult to find in Google Maps, and he refused to provide step-by-step -step directions. The numbers were oddly numbered and a jumbled mess. You would assume 58 comes after 57, but not in this area. Then I arrived at the exact time at the exact door, but the neighborhood seemed very out of place and the antithesis of something that resembles UK architecture, reminding me more of a commie block in the former Soviet Union. It was full of Slavic immigrants, and the place looked so poor that the price I paid was probably way more than the weekly rent. I am not exaggerating. I checked the address but it didn't have a name tag, a buzzer, and it looked more like a shed than an apartment. When no one answered the door, not only did I realize I've been had, but I didn't want to stay here even if it was a real listing. 
I know Edinburgh quite well, only you have to keep in mind it was Easter Sunday and most hotels had no availability. Hotels that had any availability were not in the position to quote any rates they wanted. Even one that I am a regular guest with told me they were full, on which they offered me to go around to one a few streets back that had only one left for $180, saying, you want it or not. This is a common trick they will always play because you are desperate and will make quick decisions. So what was left to do then to stay in the Edinburgh streets, with all your luggage, all the shops shut, and without any tap water? Sit and wait as the hours pass slowly. Happy Easter. Fortunately, it was a very great trip in Scotland with splendid stays at several great hotels, only this particular Airbnb booking was a hiccup. When I finally returned home, I found it strange that the host never emailed me. He never tried to call me either, nor were there any new messages in the chat box. No, where were yous, or were you all rights? When I asked for a refund, he immediately responded and blamed me for everything. He apparently left work early and spent fuel to drive home to answer the door. Which to me, gives it all away because at first he refused to say anything. But now that I am far away at home, he can after all respond within 10 minutes and very detailed. Typical. This also may seem like I went to the wrong address. But I can assure you that I've asked around several times where it was. And people said, oh, that is over there. There can be only one and it was the address he claimed it was. It doesn't matter if I get my money back from Airbnb or by credit card charger back. What is important to me is that you can get scammed at any time. It will not be safe even if you look before you leap. Hosts can always claim that you didn't show up and provide a fake address. That way they can always get away with it and Airbnb will probably side with them. Who is going to compensate me for the lonely night in the streets without a toilet and water? Needless to say, I won't do this ever again. Have you ever heard of a hotel cancelling your reservation for no reason? Have you ever heard of any hotel not opening the doors or not existing at all when you arrive? Recently, I was charged $2,800 by Airbnb, $1,800 for a booking, and then two mysterious charges of $499 each which were not linked with a booking on their platform, and for which I did not receive a record of receipt or any record of the charges on their platform whatsoever. Airbnb has thus far refused to provide a record or receipt of these charges. I received a refund for the charges but was not provided any information on their basis or cause of the charges, and the charges were somehow linked with a mysterious login from California into my account. It would have been impossible to make these charges through an external login, and so it must be assumed that these charges, two charges of $499 each, were made internally without cause through their payment processor. Airbnb also erases records of logins from the consumer-facing portal once it is discovered that the login is fraudulent, thus erasing your ability to log the history of such. So I have no ability to show that the charges were associated with a separate login to my account, but I could honestly just provide this other information as well as the arbitrary nature of the booking a booking for December made in May, seven months out. I'm considering suing Airbnb for breach of fiduciary duty. The last time anyone saw my sister was nearly a month ago. This is completely out of character for her because out of the two of us, I am the F up and she is the responsible one. However, one day her idiot friends decided to drag her along to go camping on the other side of the state why they chose to go there as their destination, I haven't a clue. While the town offered an escape from the world, it didn't have much else going for it. If you want to know what the town was like, the first thing I saw when I arrived was a child dragging a tin can with a leash, as if it were a dog. The rest of the town was very much the same. Somewhere in the void between weird, surreal, and worrying. When my sister didn't call after a few days, Everyone grew worried and did all we could think of to find her. We drove all the way over there to hang up flyers and knock on doors, but no one had seen her or her friends. The police were no help. 
Every time they saw my car, they would pull me over to tell me that there was no reason for me to worry, or that she was most likely on a romantic getaway with her boyfriend, and that I should just return home. It took all the patience I had to play nice when they said this. If they knew her, they would know that disappearing like that was impossible. Something must have happened, and I was determined to get to the bottom of it. The last time I went out to that cursed and isolated town, I packed enough for an extended stay and checked into the hotel. I only stayed there once due to the poor condition of the room. I thought I was going to have to stay in my car, and this was fine. I was willing to do it if that meant finding my sister. It was nearly two in the afternoon when I felt just how hungry I was and decided to go into the local diner. There, I overheard someone talking about a B&B &B that had just opened up, and even though it wasn't advertised online, it was ready to be rented out. Figuring I might as well check it out, I asked about it and set off to find the owner so I could rent a room for my stay. On the way out of the diner I couldn't help but to notice that the flyer I had set up in the window on my last visit a few days before was taken down. The owners, a married couple in their early 60s, were happy to have someone stay at their beach house, and after everything was in order they gave me the key code so I could get the key and enter the house. The house had to have been a 15-minute walk to the closest neighbor, but finding it wasn't hard. The building screamed old money and reminded me of a plantation. The surrounding yard was large, manicured to perfection, and surrounded by a white fence. In the front yard there was a large tree with a tire swing. Inside wasn't as nice as the outside. The light bulbs looked ancient and gave off a sickly yellow glow to everything the light touched. As far as the electronics and the rest of the house went there was no television, or for that matter, an outlet to charge my phone. I called the Keels to ask them about this, and they told me that the house was considered an historical landmark, so no renovations could be done. After settling in, I figured to take some time exploring the place during the day since I wasn't planning on being there unless I was sleeping. There was a library, a dumbwaiter, and everything else one might expect in a place that grand. The view out the bedroom window revealed a lake and a dock through the branches of a bunch of weeping willows. There wasn't a ripple in sight. If I was there for any other reason than finding my sister, I would have taken that opportunity to swim. As I walked down the hallways, after unpacking my things, I thought I heard crying. I tried searching for the source of it, but whenever I was certain that it would be around the next corner, there was nothing. At the time I just figured the noise was because the house was so old. Or that the noise was all in my head because of the stress of my sister missing, or because I didn't sleep well the night before. Ignoring what I assumed I heard, I traveled back into town to ask people if they saw my sister or her friends as well as to hang up flyers. I must have walked a few miles by nightfall and figured that I deserved a nightcap, so I went into the liquor store and bought myself a bottle of whiskey to drink when I reached the B&B. I am not much of a drinker and have a low tolerance, a fact that I am proud of but I wasn't too drunk to have imagined the ursine howl I heard after brushing my teeth before bed. That howl. It stuck in my head for a while as I tried to figure out what could make a sound like that. Finally, with the whiskey's help, sleep overcame me. I woke up feeling refreshed, but that feeling did not last long. As I got out of bed, I froze. My suitcase had been moved. Right before I went to sleep, I put the case in front of the closet door. I always did this when I slept in an unfamiliar place. It was a force of habit. This morning, the case was next to the door, not in front of it. Someone had been in my room as I slept. I quickly threw the closet open, but there was nothing out of the ordinary that I could see. I did a cursory search of the room, and again, nothing seemed to be missing. I had almost convinced myself that I must have been mistaken, that I had drunkenly forgot to put the case in front of the door even though I distinctly remembered doing it when I saw the folded paper sticking out of the pile of missing person flyers I had on the dresser. My hand was shaking as I grabbed the note, unfolded it, and read the single word written on it. Lake. That's it. Just the word lake. I fell onto the bed. My mind was racing with possibilities here. Did my sister drown in the lake? Did people cover it up? If so, why? 
None of it made any sense. I grabbed a stack of flyers, snatched up the note, and headed to town. I needed answers. My first stop was the police. When they saw me come in, they all seemed to tense up. I explained about the break-in, and they did not believe me, until I handed them the note. The officer seemed shocked. He looked like someone just punched him in the gut. He waved the sergeant over and handed him the note. The sergeant also seemed stunned. They looked at each other in silence for a few seconds, then both turned and looked at me. I am sure this was a prank, the sergeant said. If I were you, I would leave town, head home, and I am sure your sister will turn up. Furious, I yelled. Yeah, and what about the note? Looking dead in my eyes, the sergeant crumpled the paper in his hand and said, What note? I was stunned. What the hell was going on here? I backed slowly away and left the police station. I glanced back and saw the officer and sergeant had followed me outside, where they were staring at me as I walked down the street. Right as I turned the corner, I saw the sergeant, while still staring at me, pull out his cell phone and make a call. His eyes never wavered from me, not even for a second. I was unnerved. I was starting to get a little scared. There was something going on here, and my sister seemed to have been caught up in it. As I thought about my sister, the feelings turned from fright to anger. She was still missing, and no Padang Barney Fife police force was going to stop me from finding out where she is. I headed for the diner, the last place my sister's credit card was used. Once again, I noticed the flyer I had taped up earlier was missing. I went right back to where I had put it the first time, and with the cook and waitress watching me, I taped two flyers up, right next to each other. The cook shot the waitress a nervous glance and went back to his griddle. I sat at an empty booth and waited. The waitress did everything she could to avoid coming over, but I just sat there smiling at her, watching everything she was doing. She kept darting glances at the cook, where he would shake his head almost imperceptibly. Finally, she had no other choice but to come and take my order. What would you like? she asked. She seemed so nervous she was almost shaking. I would like two things. I replied, smiling. A coffee, and... She stood there, her pencil above the notepad waiting for the rest of my order. An information on why everyone in this town is pretending not to have seen my sister, you included. The waitress's eyes grew wide. She looked over at the cook who was shaking his head no, not even trying to be subtle about it anymore. Please, she almost whimpered, you need to just. And right then, the officer from the police station walked in, pointed at me, and motioned for me to go outside. What a surprise. I mumbled to the waitress as I stood up. I was a little taken aback when I saw tears in her eyes. I was not sure if they were tears of fright, compassion, or relief but she was obviously shaken to her core. I followed the officer outside, where he turned to me and said, You need to leave. Now. Not tomorrow. Not later. Now. No, I snapped back. The officer got upset. What do you mean, no? I will arrest you for hassling these good people. Then arrest me. Do it, I yelled back. It will be the first time I saw any cop in this town do anything he was supposed to do. The cop stared at me. He seemed to deflate a little bit. Listen, he said quietly. You need to go. That's all I am going to say. I ain't threatening you. I'm trying to protect you. And having said that, he turned on his heel and left. To say that I was confused is an understatement. I needed to regroup. I needed to try and get my head around this. I headed back to the B&B and my room, taking my food to go. And that was when I started to get some answers. I sat down to eat the food I had taken from the diner when I noticed there was something written up in the napkin. Look on the bottom, it said. I bumped the bottom of the bag as I did this and felt the corner of a manila envelope sticking out from beneath. I surreptitiously pulled it out. Don't open in public was written on the top. The handwriting seemed to match that on the napkin. I opened the envelope on the bed and inside were just three short articles from the local newspaper. Body found, dam to be drained Wednesday, October 12th. The Keel Dam, named after its founder and local conservationist Jared Keel, 
will be drained to allow officials to search through the lake. On October 10th, Monday morning, a tourist was hiking when he came across the body of Dina Smith, who had previously been declared dead last August after she had been missing for a decade. The body's identity was confirmed through forensic testing, and evidence of foul play was found during autopsy. Local authorities have reopened the case of Dina Smith as a murder investigation. There are currently no leads. They intend to drain the lake starting at 12 p.m. on October 15th and ending at 7 p.m. on October 16th. Authorities urge you to go be seen by your doctor if you have drank directly from the lake or swam in it with open wounds. We were unable to reach Jared Keel for comment but sources say that he is devastated with the news and hopes for a speedy investigation. Old Island to remain uncovered. New BNB to open Wednesday, September 14th. While local officials drained the Keel Lake in search of bodies, an old nearly forgotten island was uncovered. An employee at our town library immediately started a petition to keep the island exposed for the pleasant view. During the hearing on September 8th, many locals were able to express their concerns. A volunteer group was then formed to clear off the island and maintain it in order to appease citizens that believed the island a source of danger. Son of the recently deceased Jared Keel spoke of how his father wanted the island to remain covered, but agreed with the petitioner that the island improves the view. He plans to turn his father's place into a bed and breakfast by the spring and feels the two could attract tourists. His house had an excellent view of the lake, and now it will have an excellent view of the island, he was quoted as saying. Night lights on Keel Island Wednesday, August 16th. On August 12th, there were multiple reports called into local authorities of suspicious flames moving about on the island at night. An officer was dispatched to the area and reported to have found no suspicious activity. After a brief investigation, it is believed to simply be one of those phenomenons that occur from time to time. Local businesses are excited to hear this, as the lights will help bring in tourists that enjoy viewing them. Mr. Keel has updated his listing on Airbnb to include a footnote about the phenomenon. I looked up from the last article. It felt as though my veins were full of ice as I stared through the window at the island. August 12th was the last I had heard from my sister. First the note, then the envelope of articles. The way the town has been acting. My answers laid on that island. I just knew it. Did these lights have something to do with her disappearance? I had one more night left. I would wait till after dark, then find a way to the island. I was a pretty decent swimmer, but the weather had turned a bit chilly recently. The article said something about a volunteer maintenance crew for the island. They must have a means of getting there. Perhaps a boat somewhere along the lake shore I could borrow for the night without anybody being the wiser. It was about this time that somebody began pounding on my door. I crept to the door and peeked out, but didn't recognize them. They weren't the owners, and since they didn't have on a police uniform, I could ignore them. You've overstayed your welcome. Get your ass out here or will help you find a reason to leave. The larger of the two yelled, How about no? I thought as I crept around and left out the back door. I had grabbed my belongings on the way out in case the rednecks decided to bust in, and now I kept my eyes peeled for a good place to stash them. Unfortunately, there was no time. I heard the locals right behind me, and dropped my stuff in some bushes to distract them as I ran toward the lake shore. Luck didn't seem on my side at first as I scanned the sands amid twilight, but then I saw the faint silhouette of a canoe. I immediately jumped in and paddled as I heard my pursuers shouting from the tall grass. Before long their cries were muffled out by my paddle strokes, and I was alone on the lake. The moon hung above like a glistening pearl, its gleam causing the tiny island to glow. Were these the lights I'd read about? As I got closer I realized it was a variety of gemstones that poked out near the rocks. There were so many I was astounded that the townsfolk weren't using these to make the town rich. I knew as soon as I stepped foot on the island that something was off. The air felt cold and rigid, and no wind blew. There wasn't even green grass. It was just a dark void in the night, with rocks jutting aimlessly toward the center. Then I heard that howl the same one that has plagued me since I arrived. 
It was right up ahead. It was loud and visceral. It made me think about leaving immediately. But I had to see if I could find my sister. I've made it this far. I moved toward the noise, the stones blocking my view and making me feel like I was in a maze. It seemed to be coming from all directions. This howl was both terrifying and disturbing because it sounded like a creature in pain, desperate for death to swallow it up. Finally, I reached a clearing and saw a large monolithic boulder with chains tied around it. The noises were coming from the other side. As I drew closer, I realized the stone was made of pure silver, the largest I'd ever seen. And on the other side, I found the source of the growl, a beast straight from my night terrors. It was large and covered in dark fur, with fangs and claws the size of my head. I thought at first it was a werewolf, but a closer look revealed gills and a fish-hook tail. It was the strangest beastie I'd ever seen, and yet as I kept staring I realized that it was in pain and not a threat at all. Someone had captured it and left it here to die, I realized. Then as the beast thrashed about I saw something familiar dangle around its neck. My sister's locket there was no mistaking it. My mouth felt dry as I looked at the monster. Was this thing what was left of my sister? I tried to reach for her, but the creature only reacted in violence. She was angry, frustrated, and confused by what was happening. Then behind me I heard voices, and immediately I hid. To my surprise I saw the B&B &B owners walking along arm in arm, cheerfully conversing as if there wasn't a nine-foot monster chained in front of them. The husband was carrying a large wooden stake. Well, well. The offering is a good one this time. Our boy Jared done good, he mumbled as he used his weapon to poke at the monster playfully. Gonna eat good tonight, she agreed. That name they mentioned sounded familiar, but nothing was piecing together until I saw with my own eyes what they did. As the moon reached its apex in the sky, the husband staked the wolf creature straight in the heart, and I heard the mixture of my sister's screams with the howl of the monster. It took all my strength to not stop them. The wife took out two goblets from her purse, and they used them to pour blood from the wound into, and then both drank greedily. The older couple jerked and started to convulse, their bodies suddenly swollen and reverting to an earlier age. Before I knew what was happening, they looked even more youthful than I, and it was then I recognized their faces. The same ones I had seen in the article when referring to the keels, but they were supposed to be long dead. This monster, this ritual, was keeping them alive. They laughed to themselves as they finished their bloody work and left my sister to bleed out. My own blood boiled as I heard them talking about their next victim near the shore, me. We need to find that boy who came to the cabin. You know these things run in packs, if we can turn him into his monster form and chain him up too, we will have another century to ourselves, the wife chuckled. Why should we do the work? The townsfolk have tried to betray us and send him away. I say we make those yokels do our dirty work. Or it will be their skin we grind up. Ha! Ah. They sailed away as I shook away my desperation and frustration and turned toward my sister. They used you like cattle, and they'll do the same to me, I realized fearfully. I tried to recall the old legends of how someone could turn into a werewolf, a dream of revenge springing into my mind. Using my sister's large claws, I cut myself straight across the face, deep enough for the venom in her to deep into my blood. As soon as I felt it, my body convulsed and I shook in pain, except I knew I wasn't going to be gaining any youth from this. My goal would be to find the keels and destroy them, make them suffer for what they'd done. I took the canoe back to the BNB and locked myself in as the transformation begins. Unfortunately, I think this means I will lose all sense of my sanity, of my humanity. I am fearful of when this moment comes, but also I know I will have to embrace it. I must pray the locals can hunt me down and end this cruel life. With both me and the Keel family dead, maybe this lake could finally be a proper tourist trap. It's a hopeful thought to hold on to as I slip away from sanity and join the animal kingdom. I leave all this in the journals here to be found by their next visitor, I suppose. If you're reading this, it likely means the keels are still alive and I have failed. Beware the lake.
Beware the island, and most of all beware of the howls, for I cannot control what I shall do next. My sis and I were on the subject of the guy in my hometown that went on a short killing spree, and she brought this story up I told when it happened. About eight years ago I stayed downtown. Back then if you remember Craigslist had a personal section. I never really dabbled in that, but being curious I did, so I made an ad nothing spectacular and waited. Not much went down, just some scammers and bots, married people, etc. I get this one message from a young woman telling me how I sound interesting and would love to get to know me more. We exchanged pics. She exchanged an older pic, but she looked pretty cute in it. Had a bright smile and big blue eyes. She was nice, I just wasn't feeling her like that. She was 18 and I was 24 at the time, but also she was 7 months pregnant. We enjoyed conversations for a few days and we decided to link. She didn't stay far from me. She stayed more on the northeast side, just on the edge of downtown. This day it was a festival going on. I asked if she wanted to go, but she couldn't because her legs were tired and kinda sore. So I agreed to meet her at her place. She stayed in a northern slum. Not ghetto, but slum. The house was big, but also you could tell off bat that it was used as an apartment. Wasn't an appealing house, but there weren't many other appealing ones either. When I told her I'm outside, I see her come on the front porch. She was a small thing, all of about five foot zero tall, white with dark hair. Couldn't be no more than 9,110 pounds, and that was because of the pregnancy. Her baby bump was very noticeable. She had a small, chocolate Labrador puppy with her. They both were happy to see me. When I got close to her, I was surprised. She didn't have the same bright smile I saw in her pics. Her teeth were gray and her face looked like someone who was into heavy drugs. Her eyes still had light to them. But overall she looked like a tired human being and not in the fatigued sense. I gave her a hug made sure to watch my strength. We went into the place. There wasn't nothing sketchy about it. It stunk, like animals and weed. We went upstairs and I saw a black couple up there. They shut their door and it seemed like they were arguing. All the rooms upstairs seemed small and the ceilings were slanted. Her room was fitted pretty nice. She was a smoker, I smelled the ashtray stench. We decided to watch Pineapple Express. That was my first time seeing that movie. She complained about her legs a lot. I seen some little swelling on them so I gave her legs a rub. I used her body lotion. She loved it a lot and appreciated it big time. We talked and it was getting late and I wanted to head out to downtown and catch the heat of the festivities. She looked like she enjoyed my company a lot, and as we were waving goodbye for some reason I just said to myself, man that chick seems troubled. I thought of burning sage when I got home. Like two days later she hit me up saying her ex-boyfriend got kicked out of his place and he needed somewhere to stay. So me and her hanging out couldn't happen again which I didn't care, I just told her I understood and make sure she's safe. I left to Chicago to spend time with family. I came back a week later and after getting my hair retwisted, I saw a realty sign with her last name on it when I was out for a walk. She had a unique last name. I decided to check on her. I sent her an email. No response. About five minutes later I open up Facebook and as I scrolled I stopped immediately because I saw the very picture she first sent me. I'm like, why the hell is that pic on here? I click a link saying there was a triple homicide. I sat on the curb and was shocked. I couldn't believe it. I read the details and was shocked. She met a guy on Craigslist for sex. Her ex met up with him too, supposedly. He killed the ex-boyfriend and decapitated him. Left his body at a park I was familiar with. He took her and held her captive in his basement. He tortured her for a week. What made me so pissed was that he went to a sports bar down the street from me and told the bartenders how he has someone locked up in his basement right now. Nobody took it serious to call the police. That probably could have saved her. He strangled her and stuffed her in a suitcase. By then the police figured him out and he was on the run. When they stopped his car, he decided to take himself out. They found him probably because of the emails from Craigslist. I know they investigated my email. 
I deleted it immediately once I took all this in. About a month later, I was on Craigslist and I saw in the miscellaneous section about meeting scammers and such. I posted a reply about people being careful and I posted her story. Also, around then I had a guy I went to HS with who got caught robbing people for money on there. When I summarized her story I get a reply. It was from a lady demanding to know what I know. Come to find out it was her aunt. When I told her she wanted to talk on the phone so I did. I gave her my condolences and told her about the time we spent together. She told me her ex was pimping her out. Her life never was like that. Her parents were good people and confused that she took that path in life. That girl was just a baby. I've been around death before but nothing like that. Because what if I kept hanging with her? The crazier parts are, the guy had another woman in his place, but she escaped. She was living with him, and he made her a sex slave. But also, he was supposed to fly to Vegas to meet a lady for from a fetish site. But there were complications on his end. The day he committed the murder he contacted the lady and told her he wanted to meet her ASAP. He was paying for the travel and everything but she needed his info. She didn't go through with it, but she looked him up and happened to see his connection with a triple homicide. What's even more dark is that they didn't find her ex-boyfriend's head at the park, just his body. They found his head north of the city in 2019, like 25 miles away from his dead body. Why did he take that head? What he do with it to travel with it like that? The awkward thing is that there was a lady who lived with me a year later after that. Things were complicated and I had to kick her out. She moved into the exact room that chick was in. I know because I had to come over there to give her something she left. This is also the girl that played a major part in my sister and her ex-boyfriend breaking up for good. People do come into your life for a reason I suppose. I used Craigslist for business and some social events. But after that my approach became entirely different, and I became very cautious on who I met. P.S. He unalived himself after the end of the high-speed chase. The cops followed him and he shot himself. The woman was in the trunk of his car inside a suitcase. Went to the gas station down by my house. I go there daily. It was myself and my partner. We drove over with our two doggies. Small wiener dogs, one is five years always alert. A barker. Other is eleven weeks. Super friendly once we got there we parked at the pumps. My boyfriend asked what I wanted and went inside. After a couple minutes a man walked out from the station and went to his gold colored Malibu parked at the next pump beside me. He was holding my phone pretending to not be looking. I do this often I don't like people and my older dog was in the driver window waiting. She was nit barking or growling. This guy approaches the window but still at a distance says, She is so cute, can I pet her? I replied with, I don't know she doesn't usually like people, but you can try. He reached towards her. Window was half down. My older dog jumped into the back seat and began barking normal behavior. He then leans into the car halfway and takes her out of my hands. I was trying to keep a grip and but didn't want to hurt my dog so I let go as my boyfriend was finishing up in the gas station. Kind of busy but can see him through the window. My puppy begins to screech as soon as he touches her and my hands leave her. She is screaming like she is in pain. I had adjusted myself and he awkwardly shoves her back to me as I'm trying to snatch her back and my boyfriend is coming out. He asks who the guy was I said I don't know. The guy then got into his car and drove away. We also drove away and went home. I told my boyfriend he wanted to pet the other dog but reached, grabbed the pup and why, but shoved her back real quick. I have no clue who he was or is. He said he was rude to the workers and was happy I was okay. A very quick scary interaction. I can't remember the exact year, but my nan had passed away, so we had to clean her house, and it was filled with so much stuff. I was around 14 at the time, and my parents were also extremely sad at what had happened, so it was a rather depressing time for me and my sister, who were also dragged along to clear the house out. There were a lot of memories in this house, and we had spent many weekends around our nans. This was a time when she would always care for us and take care when our parents were away or on holidays by themselves. 
so we began the task of clearing out her house. At the time, it was a rather small house in the rural areas of Oregon. It was surrounded by trees and great oaks, and even had a pine forest bordering the border. This was amazing, and we'd often spend most afternoons playing outside in our garden and running through the forests. Our parents would yell at us, though, as we needed to also do our own fair share of the work, and clearing out the house was a mammoth task for only four people. Finally, my dad found a solution for us. Instead of just throwing everything away, he suggested that we should create some ads on websites like Craigslist or eBay to sell some of the stuff online. We kept the most valuable and sentimental antiques for ourselves things that meant a lot to us, and we wanted to take back to our own house. However, we had to get rid of many other things because we were planning to sell the house in the next week or two. So, my dad made a Craigslist ad and put up various items for sale. You won't believe this, but there were around 2,000 items that my dad managed to list by creating separate ads for each one. My mom suggested making one big ad with a brief description of everything for sale, but my dad is a perfectionist. He wanted to pay attention to every small detail, so he spent three or four hours every night listing each item one by one. All his effort paid off because we started getting hundreds of responses from interested buyers. People came to the house to check out the things we were selling. Some items got more attention than others. My nan lived a long life, reaching 102 years old. She lived alone for many decades, even after my grandfather passed away. Back then, my nan had a big collection of antiques, and while many of them didn't have much value, there were some china sets that were really special. They had intricate designs and interesting patterns that caught people's attention. Some folks were really interested in these china sets, and we got a lot of responses. These sets included mugs, knives, spoons, and things with woven and carved metal designs. I'm not exactly sure what to call them, but I'm doing my best to describe them. One day, a strange man came to visit us. I remember him knocking on the door to check out some of the cutlery and china sets. This man who visited had some eye issues, as they seemed to be looking in different directions. As kids, we were a bit scared because we didn't understand why he looked different. Sometimes kids can't help but stare and wonder about things that are unfamiliar. As he came in, I got a bad feeling from him, but my parents seemed unaware of it. They greeted him politely with the usual, Hello, how are you? and directed him towards the china set to check it out. My dad was under a lot of stress during that time, juggling his job and clearing out the house, so he was quite busy. But he made the bad mistake of leaving the man to look at the china set while he went off and continued to clear boxes from the upstairs. My mom was still downstairs with us while my dad was working like a headless chicken, piling things into boxes upstairs. I was sat at the computer trying to figure out this Craigslist ad and accept more and more offers. I was also doing communications and talking to people and helping them with what they wanted. My sister was sitting on the sofa, but I'm not sure as I can't remember what she was doing at the time and my mom was in the kitchen. So this guy had quite literally been left alone downstairs with us. I kept glancing over at times and he was just looking at the cutlery and the china set. He had it very close to his eyes, and he seemed to be paying attention to the fine detail on the patterns. But I don't blame him, as they really were beautiful. Some of them had Chinese-style patterns, and some were even Indian-style cutlery sets, and it was very impressive. Maybe he was just one of those people who had a knack or an interest in those types of individual unique things. Anyway, I continued to scroll through my Craigslist messages on my dad's account when all of a sudden, I heard my mom screaming. I didn't know what was happening, but when someone in your family yells out like that, you feel their pain deeply. I know it's hard to explain, but especially when you're younger, you have a strong connection with your parents at least that's how I feel. My mom's scream was terrifying, and it made me gasp. My dad heard it too and started running down the stairs, but before he could reach us, I heard loud crashing and banging noises from upstairs. It seemed like he was stumbling over boxes or dropping things while he was still busy clearing out stuff. I looked around and saw my mom in the kitchen. She was pinned against the fridge by the man who had come to see the china set. It was the scariest and most disturbing thing I could ever recall. The man visiting us started trying to take my mom's clothes off, and she fought back. 
Suddenly, my dad rushed down the stairs and immediately put the man in some kind of hold, taking him down to the floor. My mom was gasping for breath and looked like she might pass out. My dad did a great job restraining the man, and he told me to call 911 right away. I ran to my nan's old phone, which was covered in dust, and dialed 911. I tried my best to explain what was happening, but I was in such shock that my words didn't come out as I planned. It was a really scary and chaotic situation. My younger sister was crying and went upstairs all alone. The whole incident was so frightening that even now, the family still talks about it and remembers what happened. My dad was a real hero as he saved my mom from that awful man who didn't really care about the china sets. He was just trying to harm my mom. It's essential to take care of your family as they mean a lot, and we need to be there for each other. I had some baby scooters lying around outside the front of my apartment that the kids weren't riding anymore, so I thought I'd post them up for free to a good home. I spoke to a woman via text and gave her my address. I waited all evening for her to come and she never showed. Around midnight I heard a car pull in near the front of my apartment, but didn't think too much of it because cars always came and went. I did happen to look out my window and saw a red VW Beetle pulling out. The next day I went outside to find not only were the free scooters missing, but my daughter's brand new tricycles they got for Christmas, a laundry hamper full of towels and rags that I had put outside so I could clean the next day, my husband's dolly, and some other odds and ends. All of the, those things were in a completely separate location from where the free scooters were which means she snooped around my property quickly and quietly and helped herself to all my belongings. She knew exactly what was for free because of the picture and our conversation we had earlier. I tried messaging her and she'd never reply. Finally she replied and said she couldn't make it the night before and she doesn't want them anymore and she's not coming. I was livid. A couple days later I typed her phone number into Craigslist and found ads for her yard sales she has every weekend. I drove by the address given and right there in her yard were all of my belongings. I called the police and they said I had no proof, but they would drive by and ask, but if she says she didn't take them, then they have to leave it at that. I tell my mother-in-law about it, and she decides to take matters into her own hands. Her gangster ass grandma self and her sister roll up to this lady's yard sale. They approach her and say, you stole my son's belongings and point out exactly what they are. The woman denies it. This is when my mother-in-law gets really gangster lol. She starts walking up and down the street with her sister screaming, This woman's a thief. She stole my son's belongings and stole two tricycles from two little girls. Just screaming it for the entire neighborhood to hear. People start coming outside to view the spectacle that was unfolding. The thief chases my mother-in-law down and says, S-H-H-H-H, S-H-H-H, S-H-H-H, okay, 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 shut the F up. Be quiet, be quiet. You can take your stuff back. When they're done loading the car, my mother-in-law says, where's the tricycles? The woman says she sold them. A little while later, I had no idea any of this was going on, by the way. My mother-in-law rolls up to my house with my stuff and also hands me $70. She got the woman to replace the costs of the tricycles. I've never given anyone my address again for free stuff since then. Also edit to say that I just remembered that she also stole my kids' car seats. F that bitch. At least leave the car seats. So shameless. I had just moved to a new city. As a musician, I was looking for people to play with and gig. I replied to an ad that read, Established project searching for bass player. Awesome, I thought. So after exchanging an email, this guy calls me and starts talking shop. He sounds experienced and dedicated. He says he's got several songs ready to go, gigs lined up, and all the band members are very talented musicians. At this point, I am incredibly excited so we set up a time for the first rehearsal. So I show up at the rehearsal space, and soon after I get a call from this dude saying that there was some problems with the other band members, and it would just be him and I this time. I decide to stay and give it a shot anyway. In walks this person, who is wearing way too skinny jeans, fishnet fingerless gloves, and what seemed like a tub of gel on his hair. 
tattooed on eyebrows, and a very noticeable butt implant. At this point I'm like okay I'm not going to judge a book by its cover. So we go in the room and he plugs in his iPod to the paw. He proceeds to play what I can only describe as uber sexual, low quality 80s synth pop titled Dominate Me accompanied by exaggerated hip thrusting. Worst part, he really digs my playing. He is into it. More dance moves ensue. I am polite so I actually play through the entire hour of practice. He proposes we go back to his place to make some music. I refused. I was selling a guitar on Craigslist as I had more than enough, and this one just didn't get the attention it deserved. Listed it at 600 bucks firm. The guitar was a limited run, Schecter C1 with a Floyd Rose bridge, a custom camo finish and factory distressed brass hardware. Brand knew the thing listed at over 1k. Figured 600 was a fair price all things considered, especially since it had no dings or scratches. Couldn't even tell the thing was used. A few days after posting it is get a guy texting me about how he'd happily trade for it along with a smaller cash offer. Politely explained that I wasn't looking for trades and that the price was firm. He decides to go on a rant about how I'm mentally unstable. No one is going to pay that much for such a piece of shit. You're lucky if you get even half the offer I have you. As if 150 bucks with a little practice amp is somehow worth it. Told him thanks for the criticism, but I know what my gear is worth. This lead to five days of relentless texts and emails from this dude. All rage filled, each more insulting than the last. He texts me again on day six asking if the guitar was still for sale, and if I'd do business with him if he gave me more than what I was asking. As if I'd do business with someone who insulted my knowledge of my gear, my intelligence as a person, and acted like a grade a cock nozzle. So I was driving by myself on a highway in Maine, cranking killer tunes, slamming Mountain Dew big gulps, and sucking back American spirit lights. Decided to go hog wild at a Taco Bell drive through and ordered an enormous amount of food, extra fixins. So I'm devouring the Taco Bell. Had a full menu assortment. Live mass. Of course, about 40 minutes after I ate, my stomach began seizing and cramping. There was to be no refunds, no returns. Luckily, I see a rest stop coming up in about two miles. I floor it and pull in. It's about 1.30 at M, and it seems pretty vacant. There's one other vehicle in the lot, windows steamed up. I assume it's just another road tripper who had to pull over to rub one out. We've all been there. No judgment. I get out of my car and run into the men's room. I was holding the bottom of my pants when I ran in because I wasn't sure I was going to make it. Finally, I'm in the stall, and it's not a good scene. Figuring I would be in there a while, I brought my smokes and a copy of Mad Magazine. I always keep in my car for emergencies like this. I'm working on my fourth American spirit when I hear another person come in. Footsteps stop. I hear him taking deep breaths. I holler out, hey man, I'd keep those breaths shallow. No response. I can see dude's feet right in front of the stall. They're huge got to be at least a size 17. Dirty as shit, too. I sit in silence staring at these huge shoes. Sudden ass blasts squeeze out and the sound echoes in the empty restroom. All of a sudden guy starts pounding on the door, then grabbing the top and shaking it. I'll be out in a minute, you spaz, I screamed. Then it stops. I hear the footsteps again and then a lot of squeaking. Then footsteps again and the door opening and slamming shut. Of course, there was no toilet paper in the stall, and it was not a clean pinch as you can imagine. I had to use my mad magazine. Alfred E. Newman has never been so disrespected. I exit the stall and see in marker written on the mirror, See you outside, and it was signed Nitro. I'm born and bred in Maine. I've met a lot of guys who go by Nitro. Not a one do I want to meet alone at a rest stop in the middle of nowhere. I'm terrified. I hatch a plan that I am just going to go for it. I open the restroom's door and sprint to my car. Not looking back, I just run. I hear a shuffle in footsteps behind me. Ag, I hear behind me. I left my car unlocked because it's a piece of shit and I get right in. I get the car going and do a bit of a burnout and speed off. I see in my rear view mirror the silhouette of a massive man. 
He threw his hat on the ground and began jumping up and down as I sped down the highway. No idea what this guy's intentions were, but this was easily a top five scary moment for me, and I can't really bring myself to poop in a public restroom since. I was looking to try and make some friends. Stupid teenager me posted in the platonic section to try and see if maybe someone wanted to chat. I was also very lonely. A guy answered, about 34 or so. Great, we start chatting, some mutual interests. No intention of ever taking it anywhere, sexual or into the physical world. One day he tells me that I'm attractive half and that I'm his sex slave now. I protest, and he responds with texting me, Do you want me to kill your entire family? I know where you live. Where you go to school. I can kill you in a heartbeat. Of course, this scared the F out of 17-year-old me. He had a list of demands, all seemingly simple. Write this on your body with eyeliner, send a picture of it, etc. Nothing I couldn't handle. I complied, scared out of my mind. He told me to create an ad for the hookup section, and essentially act as a prostitute for him. He wanted me to write prices on my chest and rob anyone who didn't comply. I had sex with some of the people that he told me I should do, but I never did any money exchange and just planned to pay this creep out of my savings. It got worse from there. He was obviously manipulative, and one day he told me to send him pictures. I was pretty decent at image manipulation, so I positioned myself in a way to make it look like I was naked. He was pleased, and I went back to completely wearing my pants. Later he wanted a pic of something else, and my dumbass forgot the previous no pants rule. He forced me on camera to take a knife to my knees until they bled, then kneel on the carpet. I was reaching my breaking point, and he sensed that. He upped his threats, describing in detail how he would lock me in a closet and use me as a ass slave at parties. How he would arm me non-stop and make me watch as he killed those I loved. One day he pushed it too far. He asked what I was doing, and I mentioned that I was babysitting my three-year-old cousin. He asked, nay, demanded that I take dirty pictures of her and send them to him. Demanded that I molest her on camera. I filled out an anonymous police report, sent screenshots, and blocked him on everything. I do not know what happened. I don't know if the reports were ever investigated, or if he was arrested. I just know that he's out of my life, the police were alerted, and I'm safe. I never really had a horror story, but a few odd ones. I was selling a minibike, got all the usual, thing is garbage, I'll give you the dollar twenty it's worth in scrap if you bring it to me, BS. It was taking a while to sell, so I went to look to make sure it was priced competitively. I listed it two or three times, but noticed one of the ads for mine was almost twice as much. That's odd, I don't see how I made that typo. Then I notice it's from a couple towns over, and the description is tweaked a little. I sent the guy an email asking a few questions about it, specifically things on it that are in my pictures he copied into his ad, and he BS'd some pretty good answered, but stopped replying when I asked for more pics. I have no clue what his end game with that was. Another is from a couple years back when people still used tube TVs, before Goodwill and Salvation Army even refused to take donated ones. My parents had a half-decent one but upgraded to a flat screen. I put the old CRT TV on Craigslist for $30 or so. Not too many good offers one guy wants it, gives a sob story about his girlfriend with fibromyalgia needing it, and even though the ad specified pickup only he can't do the half-hour drive. So I'm working near him and agree to meet up with him. He haggles me down to $20. Whatever. The night before I ask if we're still on, he claims to only have $15 to his name till the first of the month and asks will that be good enough, or he can throw in his girlfriend's old black and white TV as a partial trade. Fine, I just want the thing gone at this point. I wake up at 5 a.m. to load this beast into my car before work. Then text him that afternoon to let him know I'm getting off work to head to the place we agreed to meet. He replies with, sorry got a better deal from someone. And another that's not a horror story. I bought a Nitro RC car off someone that supposedly only needed a small clip to get running. 
$100 in parts later, I still couldn't get it to run right, so I decided to cut my losses and sell or trade it to someone who knew what they were doing. Found someone who agreed to trade me a tablet for it, what I was looking for. I got his life story leading up to his engagement, his fiance leaving him, him finding an Amazon gift card she left behind, and him blowing it on a tablet he didn't need and hence now it's up for trade. Whatever I didn't have anywhere to be. He brought his collection of functioning RCs. He already had to the gas station we agreed to do the trade at, and we spent almost an hour ripping around one of them around the parking lot then. I don't remember what it was, but the thing was at least three feet long and an absolute beast. I was trying to get away from this money pit hobby, and went home tempted to spend ten plus more to get a badass functioning RC. About two years ago, I was looking for a new apartment. I found one on Craigslist that was really inexpensive $1,000. Cheap in the New York City area, two bedrooms, and close to my current job. It was a steal. I emailed the guy and he emails me back with an apartment application. Loving the price and the apartment, I fill out the application. Part of the application had some specific details about me like phone numbers, work number, where I work, etc. I then get a response back from this person, and he says that I was accepted and to give him a call. The number was an international number. Good old Google tells me the number was in Nigeria. I was like, flux, I've been conned. Anyway, he says that I need to wire him $2,000, $1,000 deposit, and $1,000 first month's rent, and he will FedEx me the keys to the apartment. He gives the Western Union information for me to use for the transfer. He sends another email with pictures of the apartment which were awesome. Hardwood floors, new kitchen appliances, lots of windows. I was in love with this apartment. Lol. I was scared. This guy had my information. Thank goodness that no information like my SSN or driver's license number was needed in the application. For like four hours I was trying to figure out what to do. I finally emailed the guy back and told him that I found another apartment for $800 and I had accepted it. I added also that I really could not afford the $1,000 and the other apartment was more my budget. I added, thank you for your time and God bless for good measure. I never heard back from the guy and nothing in my credit report about anything suspicious has come about. I was selling a camper. Guy comes to look at it. He's interested. We negotiate and agree out a price. It was for more money than I paid for the camper three years before. I'm stoked. Find out he's from out of state. Doesn't have a local bank. Can't give me cash. Wants to write a personal check. I say okay, but I'll hold on to the title and camper until the funds clear into my account. He agrees. I deposit the check and wait. Three days later he texts me that the funds left his account and he wants to come get the camper. I call my bank. Nope. No money in my act yet. It can take more than a week, they say. I let him know. He flies off the handle and says I'm trying to cheat him. Guy doesn't understand the process of transferring money between banks with a personal check. He starts threatening me and insisting that he's going to come get the camper that day. I say no he's not. Then my phone rings. This guy called the cops. I explain what's going on to the officer. He's cool about it. Says to wait a few more days. I do. The fun's clear. I call the buyer in the morning and tell him to meet me at my house. He literally shows up 30 seconds later. He was sitting in his truck a block down the street just out of sight watching my place. He hooks up to the camper and leaves in a huff. One week later I get a text from him apologizing for his behavior. I accepted the apology. I learned from this. Now it's cash only or we go to my bank and the buyer can get a cash advance with their debit card on the spot. My family and I needed a break, so we had to leave the city because it was very stressful. Both my husband and I had full-time jobs. He worked in an office and I worked at a nursery. Even though I loved working with children, it could be tough sometimes dealing with more than 30 noisy four-year-olds. It could be a nightmare instead of a dream. Last month, 
We were searching on Craigslist to find a vacation home. Please don't laugh, but sadly, we didn't have a big budget and couldn't afford an expensive luxury hotel trip. Looking back, using Craigslist wasn't the smartest choice. We probably should have used Airbnb, which is safer and has some rules for people who rent out their homes. But on Craigslist, there were many options. So I started looking at the holiday homes and rentals. We wanted to go far away from the city, preferably to the countryside near farms. The rent was quite reasonable because, well, what was there to see in the countryside? Mostly cows, grass, and trees. Not many people were interested in that. My kids were always on their smartphones, so that's another reason we chose rural areas. In the end, we booked a place a nice little cottage with a few extra buildings on the edge of a big farm. The man who was renting it said he owned the whole farm, and he wanted $100 a night for us to stay in the cottage. That seemed okay because we also got our own small garden with a fence and some other cool stuff. I contacted the owner and told him I wanted to give him some money as a security deposit. He agreed, and I did that in just a few seconds. Now let's skip the difficult part of getting my family ready. I only had two kids or three if you count my husband. Getting everyone ready was a big challenge, so I won't go into all the details of that. Just think about it. Five hours of arguments, kicking, screaming, and tantrums in the car on the way there. The trip itself took a couple of hours, which wasn't too bad. When we finally arrived, I was pleasantly surprised by how nice the whole place looked. Well, that was until I got to the main part of the farm. At first, the entrance of the estate had shiny new metal gates, and there were also a couple of statues on both sides like stone columns. But as we drove further in, things started to look worse. Some of the buildings were falling apart, covered in mold, and had missing bricks. Some of the windows were broken and old like they were from the 1940s. They were single glazed, which means they had only one layer of glass. Not a great start. But after following the instructions from the owner, we finally found the small bungalow or cottage we had paid to rent. We had paid for a whole week, which felt like too long to me, but we couldn't afford any longer. Plus, I didn't want to stay any longer, especially after seeing the place. So there we were, sitting in our truck in front of this. Well, it wasn't even a cottage. It looked like it had been built a very long time ago by hand with cobblestone-like bricks. The truck was running as I put it in neutral. My husband and I had been taking turns driving. It was around 3 p.m. by then, and we hadn't left until late, which caused all the tantrums and arguments. I wondered if this trip was really worth it as we sat there in front of the cottage. So I decided to check out the place. It was important to see if it was even suitable to stay in. It didn't look like a place where people could live comfortably. I know it was summer, but we didn't come here to camp, and having holes in the building wasn't acceptable to me. I wanted my money back, and I wanted it right away. My husband was trying to tell me that this was normal, but I wasn't convinced. So I stepped out of the car, still arguing, to check out the place. We told the kids to stay in the car, locked it, and then my husband and I went to see what it was like. We found the key where the owner had told us it would be under the floor mat. Opening the door was no problem. When we went inside, it wasn't as bad as I had expected. I went quiet, and my husband was trying to explain that it just looked bad from the outside. Well, as we moved from room to room, I started to think that maybe he was right. It was clean and tidy, a three-bedroom cottage with a bathroom that wasn't covered in mold, falling apart, or filled with sewage. The inside of the place actually looked pretty good, which was surprising given how it looked from the outside, so we decided to stay. I unlocked the truck and told the kids to come inside. We brought all our suitcases and bags in and got settled. By this time, it was around 4 p.m., and we started to relax. The furniture, appliances, and everything inside were old, but it wasn't terrible. The outside of the cottage was in bad shape, but they had made an effort to keep the inside nice. It seemed like they had put in new flooring and did some renovations. As the evening approached, we still had to prepare dinner. I had bought a lot of supplies, including dry pasta, rice, some sauces, and even some meats that were in our cooler in the back. On the first night, we were going to have spaghetti bolognese, and that's when everything went wrong. At that time, I was starting to feel comfortable and relaxed. I was in the kitchen, 
the kids were in their rooms playing on their iPads, and my husband was sitting and watching the small old TV. I was daydreaming for some reason, not sure why, while preparing the food in the kitchen. I looked out the window. I was actually starting to enjoy this calm feeling. Normally, all I saw was busy traffic on the street below, with the city constantly making noise and bright lights. I'll be honest, I got used to it, but that didn't mean it didn't drive me crazy. I just got used to it over time. As I was cooking, everything was going well. In fact, it didn't take me too long to make the bolognese, maybe about 15 to 20 minutes. I just had to cook the ground meat and boil the pasta. The sauce came in a jar ready to use. I poured the sauce in, mixed everything together, and heated it in a big frying pan that I had bought, by the way. Yeah, I was a bit picky. My youngest daughter liked to have her bolognese separate from her pasta, which was kind of strange. She preferred to have the spaghetti in one bowl without sauce and the bolognese meat and sauce in another bowl. After I cooked everything and prepared her separate bowls, I served the meal and called everyone to the kitchen table. The kitchen table was old and made of carved wood. It looked like someone had made it by hand, and it was probably the nicest thing in the house, although my husband would disagree, as he was still glued to the old small television. When we all gathered at the table and were ready for dinner, my little girl said something really strange. Just as she was about to eat her spaghetti, she picked up her fork and said, You mom, why is it green? I glanced over and didn't think much of it but when I went closer, I noticed that it did have a slight greenish tint. The pasta had a greenish color, which I found a bit odd. I couldn't see it on our plates because it was already mixed with the red bolognese sauce and meat. I told her not to worry and made up a story about it being a different kind of pasta. I wasn't being honest, but I was just so tired from two hours of traveling and the stress of seeing the outside of this place. We all finished our meal, and not more than a couple of hours later, the trouble started. First, my husband had to run to the toilet and was throwing up a lot. Then, my daughter started having really bad diarrhea. Luckily, this cottage had two bathrooms. To make a long and gross story short, we later found out that the water we used to cook the pasta, which came from a well near the cottage on the farm, was contaminated. It hadn't been tested for safety, and it caused all our stomach problems. After that, we all got sick and had to stay in the cottage for four days. It was a tough time. When we finally got better, we went straight back home. But during our illness, we had to have doctors visit us. At one point, my two youngest kids were almost dehydrated because they were vomiting and having diarrhea so much. So, I wouldn't call it a vacation and it was far from relaxing. The person who owned the farm and estate didn't respond to us after that. We didn't want to take any legal action because we just didn't want to deal with it, and my husband felt the same way. But there was definitely something wrong with the water. It had a greenish color, and the well was clearly contaminated with some kind of bacteria that didn't agree with our stomachs. Those four days were awful, really awful. We were so desperate that my husband ended up staying in one bathroom, and my two children stayed in the other. I stayed outside and used a big bowl I found in the kitchen. It was a large bowl they used for mixing flour and baking. Thankfully, I didn't have diarrhea, but I was very sick too. We all tried to sleep it off, but during those four days, there was constant vomiting and crying. It was terrible, and the worst was on the third day when we called 911 because of my youngest daughter. Every time she tried to drink something, she would just throw it back up. I was getting really scared, but I was so tired that making the call to 911 was hard for me. When the medical team arrived, they gave all of us shots in our behinds to stop the vomiting. It worked, and we all started feeling better. After getting the shots in the end, we all recovered fully and returned. So I regularly browse my Craigslist missed connections page at work because they're often really cute or really creepy, and either way it's entertaining. Basically, people post about other people they've passed on the street or briefly talked to, and they regret not getting their information so they try to connect over this forum. Normally it's like, we talked in the parking lot of Sprouts, I'd love to take you out. If it was you, tell me what I was wearing. However, I was on it today while at lunch, and I found a post that said paraphrased. I caressed you and touched your bare torso from behind. 
I told you I would get a tattoo to remember that moment, because that is when I fell for you. You clenched up when I told you that. I have feelings for you. I will hunt you forever. Wasn't about me, but gave me the creeps. Who describes courting someone as hunting? Anyway, I linked the post. If you guys haven't checked out your local Missed Connections page on Craigslist, I would highly recommend it for some creeps. Who knows? You might even be on it. Man tried to pay me 12 mail $20 to get in his car. This happened in the early to mid 1980s. I was about 12 and had a group of friends that I hung out with regularly. I lived in Kenner, Louisiana. Anyway, there was this fad back then to open these teen nightclubs. No alcohol, disco music, and the same vibe as the cocaine-induced frenzy of adult disco clubs. Anyway, one was opening up. My friends couldn't stop talking about it. I hate crowds, but I was a follower in my group, so I agreed to go with everybody. One of our parents dropped us off. We paid our $2 to get in. I can see that it's super crowded, shoulder to shoulder. I kinda just hung out around the front door debating whether or not I was gonna stay. After 10 or 15 minutes pass, I get this feeling like someone's watching me. Just an eerie creepy vibe. So I just start looking around, there's a lot of people so it's like a blur. Then I notice this middle aged guy, short brown hair, striped collared shirt. He's just starting at me like he knows me or something. Well I knew I didn't know him and that was my cue to leave. It was about a five mile walk down a well lit, semi busy two lane highway then right and another couple miles down a four lane road into the subdivision. It's only about 8 p.m. and I don't have to be home till midnight so I had time to walk it. So I take off walking. And I guess about halfway home this car pulls up on a side road that I was crossing and it's the same guy from the nightclub. My heart starts pounding out of my chest. He creeped me out around 200 people. I was really creeped out on an isolated side street by myself. He yells at me and asks if I want a ride. It's pretty far but f that, lol. I said no and kept walking. Then he yells at me, ya wanna make an easy $20, and I'm dumb. I stop and ask, how, he says, get in the car and I'll tell ya. Nope, I just bolted. I took off and I don't think I've ever ran that fast in my entire life. I ran the last three miles full speed without stopping and without looking back. I made it home, ran inside the house and straight to my room. I didn't even think to look back to see if he was following me, but if he came here at least my dad was in the living room. I never told anybody. I really think I was one dumb move away from being on a milk carton, or worse. Did I accidentally become a horror story? I bought a beat up old Broyhill Brasilia dresser from a lady in Hollywood. Paid in cash organized the whole thing via text. I could tell she was sad to see it go, but it needed a lot of work and I love that kind of furniture. A few weeks later I finished restoring it and it looked beautiful. I was super proud of it and sent her a photo of the completed work with another thank you for selling me the piece in the first place. I never heard back. Was that creepy of me? Whoops. A few years ago, I wanted to sell one of my Kawasaki motorbikes because I needed some extra money. The bike was still worth around three to four thousand dollars at that time, even though it had been used for a few years and had many miles on it. Luckily, there were lots of bike enthusiasts all over the state where I lived. First, I tried posting about the bike in some groups, but the offers I received were very low, and I didn't want to accept them. Then I had an idea to put an ad on Craigslist. Surprisingly, it turned out to be a success, and within just 10 minutes of posting the ad, multiple people replied, showing interest in buying the bike. Sadly, the pictures I took of the bike weren't great, as I used my phone, and some were taken in a funny way that made the ad look unprofessional. But I made sure to clean up the bike, and I want to remind everyone that I took good care of it, and it was in good condition. I knew the bike's true value, and I was confident that I could get the right price for it. Now the challenge was to sort through the potential buyers who wanted to see the bike and make an offer. It's always tough to figure out who is serious about buying, and who just wants to get a really cheap deal to sell the bike for a higher price later. 
In this situation, I only replied to the messages from interested buyers, and it was overwhelming. My Craigslist had received hundreds of replies in just a day or two, and my phone kept buzzing constantly. It became too much to handle, and I thought about ending the ad, but I decided to keep going and started going through each message one by one. To make it easier, I used a copy and paste reply saying, Thank you for contacting me about the bike. I'm asking for this price, and are you willing to agree to this offer? Most people replied back, but the majority of them tried to negotiate for a lower price. Out of the 500 replies, about 10 to 20 seemed like serious buyers. People were interested in buying the bike at the full price, but they all had one thing in common. They wanted to see it first. It made sense because you wouldn't want to buy something without checking it out, especially if it's not from a trusted seller or dealer. There could be potential issues or something shady going on. So I started setting up meetings with interested buyers to see the bike. The first person, let's call him John, was in his early 50s and looked like a typical biker. Interestingly, he arrived on a Harley, which was quite different from my Kawasaki bike. At that time, most people riding Kawasaki bikes were young folks who enjoyed speed, while Harley riders tended to be older bikers. But this man John was different. He showed interest in the bike, even mentioning that he wanted to buy it for his younger son who was getting into biking. I thought it was a cool idea, but when it came down to the price, John wasn't willing to pay the full amount I asked for. I couldn't budge on the price because I had so many other potential buyers waiting to see the bike. I had set a plan with a specific amount, and I wanted to stick to it. Before putting up the ad, so John left without making a deal. The next potential buyer who came to see the bike was named Graham. He was in his early 20s and had just started getting into biking, or at least that's what he told me. Graham said he had been saving up money from his job to buy a bike, and the 400 cubic centimeters Kawasaki seemed perfect for him. It had enough power for his needs, but not too much that it would be overwhelming for a beginner like him. Graham claimed he had recently obtained his biking license and was really excited about buying this bike. I told him firmly that the price was not negotiable, it was fixed. However, I did allow him to come and take a look at the bike if he was genuinely interested. On Tuesday evening during springtime, around 5.36 p.m., Graham came to see the bike right after finishing his work shift. He parked his car in our driveway and got out. Graham was dressed in jeans and a polo shirt that seemed like a uniform from a retail job, probably for customer service. He greeted me with a handshake and introduced himself. We started chatting and made some small talk as people usually do in such situations. But while we were talking about bikes and how great it would be for Graham to start biking, he started inspecting the bike like a pro, even though he had admitted to never riding one before. The surprising thing was that he looked at everything, I mean absolutely everything. He opened the tank, checked the brakes, and even examined the disc brakes and pads closely. Then he went to the back and used the light to look inside the exhaust. It was quite awkward to continue our small talk while he was busy checking out the bike so thoroughly. Finally, after all that inspection, he made an offer that was more than $1,500 below the price I had asked for. Not only did this enrage me and make me annoyed, but it made me realize I had just wasted my time, and this man had ignored my request of no offers. I allowed him to come round and look at the whole bike and fiddle with it like he was some kind of an expert, and after all that, he comes up with the excuse that the brakes are worn. Now, number one, I knew for certain they weren't worn, as I had just had this bike fully serviced at the local bike dealer only a week before selling this. That was the reason why I had it serviced, so that I could sell it with peace of mind. And having that as evidence, I ran into the house and grabbed the service document with proof saying who serviced it, what they did, what they checked, and nowhere on that form did it say anything about brake pads or brake discs being worn. He seemed to think otherwise, and even though he admitted he was an absolute newbie when it came to biking, he thought that the brake discs were worn, and that somehow they had been worn down very low. I knew deep down this is absolute nonsense, but that was his way of justifying such a low offer. I looked him straight in the eye and said, no low offers. There's nothing wrong with this bike, and if you're not willing to pay the full asking price, then leave immediately. Something switched in this man's eyes. 
He went from being the happy beginner biker checking over my bike to almost looking like a psychopath. Now his eyes began to dilate, and he stared at me with a frown that could kill a thousand children. I couldn't believe what was happening. Graham didn't say a word, just stared at me with a blank expression. It made me feel uneasy and unsure of what to do. I was alone, as my wife was inside watching TV. With a firm voice, I told him to leave, trying to sound confident even though I was uncertain about his intentions. I worried that he might act crazy or become aggressive. Thankfully, he turned around without saying anything, walked back to his car, and drove away. The whole encounter was incredibly awkward, and I couldn't understand why he behaved that way. It left me feeling quite uneasy and puzzled. The brakes were clearly not worn, as I'd had them checked by professionals. But this guy, Graham, seemed to make up some strange excuse to lower the price by a huge amount, which was not fair at all. The bike was priced reasonably, and I didn't want to be taken advantage of. So I had to start the process all over again and go through more potential buyers who wanted to see the bike. Many of them were still offering very low amounts. But then I came across another offer from a guy named Reese. He was willing to offer only $200 less than the asking price and still wanted to take a look at the bike. Reese told me that he wanted to show the bike to someone else in a different state. He asked me to meet him halfway, and since I had a truck and had transported the bike before, I agreed. We decided to meet at a Walmart parking lot about a hundred miles away. The drive was quite long, almost an hour. When I finally reached the Walmart parking lot, I couldn't believe what I saw. It wasn't Reese waiting for me. It was the same guy Graham whom I had met before. I was shocked and couldn't believe this was happening. When I saw that it was the same creepy guy Graham with his unsettling eyes, I felt a sense of danger. I decided not to stop the truck and continue driving around to assess the situation. He was waving me over, but I couldn't trust him, even though he claimed to be willing to pay the full price that day. I didn't take any chances because I didn't know what he was planning. There was something fishy about him wanting to meet me at that nearly empty Walmart parking lot late in the evening after he supposedly finished work. He had lied about living in another state and even used a different name to act like a different buyer. This whole situation seemed really suspicious, and I didn't want to put myself in a risky position. So I kept driving and didn't stop the truck. He tricked me into driving almost an hour across the state to meet him, pretending to be someone else, but I didn't fall for it. I knew something wasn't right, so I didn't stop the truck when I saw him at the Walmart parking lot. Instead, I quickly turned around and drove back the way I came. I felt relieved that I didn't stop because it could have been dangerous. I wonder what he had in mind if I had gone out of the truck and met him again. He seemed really crazy, and I'm glad I trusted my instincts and got out of there. It was a quiet evening in the small town of Riverton, and my friend Jake was on the lookout for a good deal on a computer. He had been searching online when he stumbled upon a seemingly incredible offer on Craigslist. The ad promised a high-performance computer at a fraction of the market price, and Jake couldn't resist the temptation. The seller, who went by the username Techwiz77, agreed to meet in a deserted parking lot on the outskirts of town. Eager to score a fantastic deal, Jake arrived at the meeting spot, a sense of excitement mixed with a hint of caution. The setting sun cast long shadows across the empty lot as he approached a figure standing next to a nondescript van. Techwee 77, a middle-aged man with a scruffy beard, greeted Jake with a nod. As they discussed the details of the transaction, a chill ran down Jake's spine. Something felt off, but he brushed it aside, attributing it to the eerie atmosphere of the deserted location. Moments later, just as the exchange was about to take place, a dark figure emerged from the shadows, demanding money. Panic set in as the situation escalated into a tense confrontation. The mysterious figure, face concealed by a hoodie, brandished a 45, demanding Jake hand over his wallet. Fear gripped Jake, and he hesitated for a moment, torn between complying and making a run for it. Before he could make a decision, a gunshot echoed through the air, and a searing pain erupted in Jake's stomach. He crumpled to the ground, clutching his wounded abdomen, the computer transaction now a distant memory. In the chaos that ensued, the assailant fled, leaving Jake writhing in pain. 
Fortunately, a passerby had witnessed the incident and called 911. Within minutes, the sound of sirens filled the air as an ambulance rushed Jake to the hospital. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.